Well, here we are in Spring Valley. It's uh, one of the nicest neighborhoods in the district. Um, some of the houses sell for more than a million dollars. But uh, this is where I grew up. Well, Spring Valley is pretty peaceful and the greenery is absolutely wonderful. And, and uh, there's, there's no crime to speak of. It's a very pleasant part of Washington to live in. It's comprised of about 14,000 residents. There are 1,300 properties. You have American University. You've had a lot of uh, congressmen and senators and former presidents who used to live in Spring Valley. In 1993, things really changed when uh, a contractor installing utilities at 52nd Court uh, uncovered a burial pit from World War I. We, we were uh, having breakfast right inside the window and one of the guys came and knocked on the window and said, I suggest you don't come out in the backyard. And I said, why not, leaning out the window? And he said, look, and right down in the bucket of the uh, front end loader was a mortar shell. My countrymen, the surpassing war of all times has involved us and found us utterly unprepared in either a mental or military sense. When, when the war started, the U.S. had no capability to use chemical weapons in attack or defend against them. And so we had to develop a program. There was in existence something called the Bureau of Mines. They investigated mine gases and ways to protect miners from poison gases that might be in the mines. And so they had a, already a pretty good sized unit at American University. And so American University, all their students went to war and they'll offer their campus to the government. Uh, what purpose the government saw fit in that 1917 uh, was to do uh, a gas research and development and production facility. So at the, at the research station they were trying to find chemicals that were good to use against enemy soldiers and they were also trying to find ways to protect American soldiers from enemy chemical attack. So the Americans went about this in kind of a typically American way. They really got excited all at once and we're going to go do this thing and we're going to get our troops together, we'll get them over there, and we're going to advance on all fronts. Now they had 1,200 engineers and chemists and scientists working at American University and 700 support staff. What they did developmentally is they had hundreds of like small amounts of chemicals. They would experiment with them in the labs and as things started to look promising, they would make them in larger amounts and as they continued doing a developmental research when they got something that looked promising they would make it in amounts where they could go out and test it in the field. They did a lot of research on blister agent which was a mustard gas, phosgene which irritates your lungs, they worked on vomiting agent, they worked on tear agent. And they researched some 1600 compounds up there and of those they refined out about 30, 35 different poison gas compounds that they could make cheaply make easily, they were heavier than air, and they did various things to the animal subjects that they used for the testing. They did hundreds of field tests. They would put a round or two in a test trench, or they would put 40 or 50 shells in a bank, and they would put, you know, 25 goats or 25 dogs out in front. They had little glass jars that would take air samples every 10 or 15 seconds, and they would keep track, you know, this was the concentration of the measure at X time, Y, Z, and then they would keep track of the casualties of the animals to see again, you know, which agent was more effective in inflicting harm. They also did tests on human beings. They had two human test buildings. Some were volunteer soldiers or other people that volunteered. Obviously, they didn't try to kill them with high potency. They used lower levels of gas. Uh, see how long a soldier could ride a bicycle being exposed to a certain level of some gas, for example. Guys would don gas masks that had different kind of screens in them to see what screen worked. They were also trying to protect soldiers from blister agents, so they would uh, make chemicals to apply to uh, fabric of uniforms, and they would put 
you know, mix A here, mix B here, and mix C there, and then they would put agent on the uniform and have the guy put it on to see what was most effective in protecting him from getting injured by the agent. And, and things that were better, they did more developmental work on, and when they got something that they really liked, they would farm it out and have it mass produced either at a, a chemical plant somewhere, or uh, they built a facility at Edgewood to mass produce chemicals because all of the industrial plants were, were uh, working at full capacity in support of the war effort. Poisonous gases did not determine the outcome of this war. Uh, they added, however, to the horror of the war in such a way that by the fourth year, people were utterly drained of, uh, of what had led them to war. It transformed war into what it is in the 20th century, a, a nightmare. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone was still yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. He plunges at me, guttering, choking. Drowning. When it came to the closure of AUES, AU gave the Army permission to bury munitions in a remote part of the campus. There was a latrine. Well, when you're burying gas at the end of the project, what a great place to put it on the last day. You've already got a big hole dug. You know, it was common practice. They were just following what their, what their directives were. Another story tonight in this age of living dangerously. The Defense Department says there are some 1,100 former military installations, now private property, on which unexploded ammunition could be buried. One case in point is in Washington, D.C. NBC's Robert Hager reports. Now in an area of new construction, a startling discovery dug from two pits. World War I shells, 75 years old. You know, 92 years ago, this is where the work at the American University Experiment Station began. Uh, we've since learned that this is where they disposed a lot of the uh, laboratory glassware and here we are 92 years later the Army Corps is still cleaning it up. We don't know how many shells they buried. They never had a burial map. It was buried it was forgotten. They thought it was over. They never expected that area to be built up like that. Where I think the government uh, is at fault is in not only burying the munitions but burying the information. What can be done to transfer these documents that are under the control of the Army to the National Archives or some other secure facility so that a thorough historical research can be conducted? That's the first step in any cleanup. There are several organizations that have things to hide, including the Army Corps, EPA, DC, and uh, American University. Oh, and even the residents. One of the problems was that a lot of people uh, were afraid to admit that their property might have arsenic or lewisite or anything on it because they didn't want their property values to go down. I mean, they used part of the American military history. You know, like it or not, they, were, they offered the campus the use of the government during World War I. They did the same thing in World War II. There's a plaque outside that says, you know, this is the birth of the Chemical Warfare Service. So, you know, They've got a part of America's history on that campus, but the flip side is there's, you know, kind of a price you pay for that. Uh, I got cancer in the year 2000, and of course I had worked a lot in the garden, always loved digging and, and working around, and I had some other neighbors, the Dudleys, who lived where the Korean embassy is, and they had died of cancer. We began to realize that right in this immediate neighborhood and across the street there are two or three or four people who I know personally in those 50 years who had died of various cancers. Here we were planning on using, using these chemicals against the Germans, but instead uh, they're, they're haunting uh, our own residents. It's like a cup of poison that you prepare for someone else, but you end up drinking yourself. Pass the game, 
that's played by all the soldier boys in each brigade. It's called Humping the Hun. This is how it is done. First you go get the gun, then you look for a hun, then you start on the run for the son of the gun. You can capture them with ease, all you need is just a little limber cheese. Give them one little smell, they come out with a yell, then your work is done. When they start to advance, shoot them in the pants, that's the game called hunting the hun. First you go get the gun, then you look for a hum, then you start on the run for the son of the gun. You can capture them with ease, all you need is just a little limber cheese. Give them one little smell, they come out with a yell, then your work is done.